You're listening to the Woman of Value podcast. You are about to hear the story of a woman who is following her dreams and passions and creating positive change in the world. We are we are suffering from an over busy, overdoing, overgrowing, overgoing culture that um, that we've all assimilated into that does not value the feminine qualities and feminine power and feminine wisdom. My guest today is Christine Arilo. She is an MBA and the author of Overwhelmed and Over It. And if you have video, if you're watching this on video, you can see the cover of the book here. It's a fantastic book. And she's a transformational leadership advisor. She has written three bestsellers and she's the host of the popular Feminine Power Time podcast. She is recognized worldwide for her work helping women to make shift happen in the lives they lead, the work they do, and the world they wish to create. Welcome to the show, Christine. Thank you, Sandy, for having me here. And hello, everyone. I'm so looking forward to our conversation today. I poured my coffee this morning um, into my one of my favorite cups. It has all these hearts on it. So it's like, it's like a I feel like it's always like gar- growing a garden of, of love and, um, and heart. And I've had it for over, gosh, 12 years now. So um, I think we'll have a good, juicy, heart-nourishing conversation today. I think so, too. And I love that, Mike. Too bad if you're not listening on t- on video because you won't be able to see it. But go look at the video. It's worth it just for the <laughs> mic. <laughs> um, so, Christine, what does woman of value mean to you? Well, it was interesting posing that question um, because it's almost like I don't know what a woman of value, like it's like almost like one of those questions, like, well, how could a woman not be of value? <laughs> you know, it's like those, you know, and I, and I get why you asked the question because it's because, because in our world, it's not, women are not valued. The feminine isn't valued. And, um, and so to, to me, it's, we are valuable inherent in who we are. And a woman um, of value is, is how we're born. And I feel like right now in our world, all of us that are alive, I think we're like one big generation. Um, we're here to, to reestablish how, um, how valuable the feminine actually is, like what it really means to be a woman, not through the eyes of the media, not through the eyes of marketing, not through the eyes of our parents, but inherently as a woman, um, what we bring, who we are, and that we are both deeply compassionate and amazingly courageous. We are absolutely graceful and super fierce. And so it's that capacity to be that full spectrum of ourselves without apology um, for any of them and defining who we are um, based on who we are and anybody else's version of what that should be. Wow. That's a lot. And I, I totally love it. I think, you know, the without apology really stands out for me because I think that most of us grow up apologizing for everything. I mean, the I'm sorry woman thing that goes on, you know, it's just they didn't even do anything and they're apologizing and and not to recognize your worth. I think that, you know, that's just been my mission as well because I grew up not really appreciating who I was and what I had to offer. And so many women, when you ask them, like, you know, what's your, what's your superpower? What's your best quality? What, who, who are you? And they'll say, I, I, I like my hair. I, you know, I have, I, I have rosy cheeks. Like, I mean, it's like very hard for us to really define what makes us special, what makes us unique as people. And, um, so like, how did, how did you get there? How did, how did you get to where you are today? <laughs> I'm just curious. And I'm sure our audience wants to know as well. Yeah, I, I have kind of two, two defining moments that I know we'll, we'll get to those as we, in our, in our conversation, but I feel like they'll resonate with a lot of everyone that's here. I am, um, you know, I was, I was, I grew up in Chicago in the middle of America and I didn't know anything about anything other than what I knew was around me. Cause that's kind of how it was designed. And so the way I, the way I cope, I mean, some people, the way that we, we go into the, we operate in the world is we are trying to get 
uh, acknowledgement from out there in different ways. You know, for some people, when I was doing my, my, my third book is about the inner mean girl, which is what that is, that inner self, that um, inner mean girl and the inner wisdom. The inner mean girl is that part of us that pushes us and pressures us to actually operate outside of who we really are as a way to basically stay safe and stay belong and fit in and, you know, be protected and all of that. And our inner wisdom is obviously the one who knows how we can stay true to our own path. So I was born with a lot of self-esteem. I know I was born with confidence. My personality is a, is a confident personality. And it's interesting in our culture, we kind of herald that like, oh, she's confident. She has a lot of self-esteem. So it's a lot easier to go through life that way. And everyone's like, well, of course she values herself because I did. And, um, and yet I didn't truly love myself because I didn't even know what that was. And it's interesting. I have a lot of friends on the other side who you would look at them and be like, oh, well, they're less confident. They're, they're insecure. And we judge people like that as less than the confident ones. And I can tell you from my own experience and working with lots of women around the world and having lots of friends on both sides of that spectrum, none is better and none is, none is, none is, none is better than the other. Just easier to hide as a person who's like a high achieving, confident person. And so for me, I went through my life that way. And I did all the things. I checked the boxes, you know, not the good girl boxes, but the achiever boxes. And so I went to, you know, I, I got out of the South side of Chicago. I went to college at my MBA. I had good jobs. I got the big house and then I bought the bigger house and I was engaged to be married. You know, I was like, these are all the things you do to be successful. And at the age of 30, I had what I call um, my universal two by four, which knocked me out of the life I had so conveniently built to put me into the life I was actually destined to live. And my wake up call came at the, um, the, at the, at the hands of my then fiance who broke up with me on the way to our engagement party. Longer story for a different time. But the moral of the story is um, where that left me two weeks after I kind of recovered from the shock. Um, was sitting with myself and this question emerged, like how did a smart woman who has a lot of friends, who seems well-adjusted, how did I end up here? Like actually engaged to a person who was not actually really very nice to me, very kind to me, and also settling in a lot of ways that were because I wanted to stay in the relationship. I was afraid to leave the relationship, but it wasn't his idea of what life was in my idea, very different. I wanted to move to California and work in fashion and have an adventure. He wanted to move farther into the suburbs and like hunker down. And um, I remember I got really quiet in that voice, that inner wisdom voice spoke to me. And she said, you know, Christine, you have a lot of self-esteem, but you don't love yourself. And I was like, that moment, you know, where you're like, oh my God, that's true. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. What the heck does that even mean? Love yourself, love your what? And, and then it was so, so excited, I kept talking and it was like, and you know, not only did you almost marry the wrong guy, but you almost created the wrong life. And I was like, oh, that's right. And that night I made two promises. One, I'll figure out what loving yourself is and I'm gonna do it, <laughs> the cheaper in me. And two, I promised to never settle for less than my heart and soul desire. And that became the foundational vow um, for self-love. There's five. And that's the first one, as I promised to never settle for less than my heart and soul desire, which meant I had to be like, well, what does my heart and soul desire? I didn't even know. I didn't know what my heart was. I didn't like, I didn't, I didn't been no training in that. I didn't know what my soul path was. And, um, you know, here I am 20 years later with all of you. And thank God I send him little love grams, you all, all the time, little gratitude grams. Thank you so much for breaking up with me without having to get married because so many of my friends ended up getting married and then having to deal with all of that and the children and all of that. So I send him little love grams um, all the time about that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for breaking up with me. Well, yeah, that wake up call, sometimes we need it. Like we need to, but well, it, it depends on what we learn from it. But it sounds like you... You had all the doing and not the being, um, you know, you were good at all the doing. And it's, it's, I was just talking to my son this morning about how little quiet time we have today with all of our technology and everything we're plugged into, how few of us really take time to be quiet with ourselves. And I was remembering how active I was in my 20s. I was always on my bike, taking long rides to nowhere and we didn't have iPods and we didn't have things to plug our, into our heads. Like today, if I go for a walk by myself, I'm listening to a podcast, I'm doing something, 
learning, growing, doing. <laughs> it's hard for me to be quiet with myself. And those moments like in the shower where there is no distraction are when the good stuff comes through. And so I, I would love to hear what you have to say about like people creating that quiet time because you wouldn't have mm -hmm. heard that voice if you didn't have that. No. And you know, that, that voice, I had to, I had to go to the moment of distress. You know, this is what happens to a lot of us. We have to get to distress, drama, disease, or divorce in order to actually listen to that voice. And I made a promise to myself. I'm like, never again. I, I want no more Mack trucks. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, and I was really clear. I could have just, I could have masking taped over all of it and then, you know, kept going, but instead I dove deep. And I think that's where we're at right now in the world too, is that um, we are, we are, we are suffering from an over busy, overdoing, overgrowing, overgoing culture that, um, that we've all assimilated into that does not value the feminine qualities and feminine power and feminine wisdom. And um, I think I'll tell a little story a little bit later about the second time that voice talked to me when I realized I didn't have the feminine, but I, but I, but I would say is that, you know, if you think about the feminine, if you think about feminine and masculine power, they're, they're actually very connected to yin and yang. So it's like, it's not a new theory, right? So yin and yang, Taoist tech, technology, wisdom teaching, thousands and thousands of years old. You all know the yin and yang and it has a little symbol, the black and the white, and there's a little, you know, that thing. In psychology, there's the anima and the animus. And the way I teach it is really about understanding our feminine power and our masculine power and valuing both of those. As I was researching overwhelm and trying to really get into like, why is it we keep burning ourselves out, self-sacrificing, exhausted all the time? There are some systemic reasons out there that cause us to not value the feminine within us. And so from an elemental perspective, the feminine is water. And the masculine is fire. We have both, which I was kind of saying fierce, fierce grace is like how I always like, if I was to say, what is a woman who's embodying her power and her worth feel like fierce grace. And that fierceness is the fire. That's the masculine and the, and the, and the grace is the, is the water, the, the, fe the feminine, and they come together and they create the empowered woman. And I think that what I see is that we're scared of slowing down. I mean, this has been my I have two primary spiritual teachers. Neither of them know each other. They're both women in their seventies and eighties. They've been working with me for, for decades and they both taught, or would tell me the same lesson. Christine, slow down. Christine, slow down. It took me over a decade to actually, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, but I am so they'd be like, mm, yeah, nope, no, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> like, really? And I'm just like, oh. And so it's so interesting because when I first started this process of like being, you know, and being able to be still and slowing down, my nerve, like I would, I remember laying on the couch you all one day, and my husband is way better than this. He's so much more <laughs> and was way better. And he's like, just go sit on the couch and do nothing. I'm like, okay. So I sit on the couch and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? He's like, nothing. You're just supposed to be still. I'm like, well, can I read? He's like, no. He's like, I mean, can I watch TV? He's like, no, just be. And I'm not kidding, Sandy and everyone. My body like literally started to twist because my nervous system couldn't handle it. You know, it was so used to being on all the time. And, you know, fast forward now to my life and it isn't that I don't find times of overwhelm and stress. Of course they show up, but I, they, I never get to the point rarely of distress and drama and disease. And I think if I'll just say one last part is that this is, I'm looking, I live on, I live on an island off the coast of Seattle. I'm looking right now out at the water and the tide comes in and out every day. It ebbs and it flows. I watch the sun come up, the sun come down every day. The moon come up, the moon come down almost every day. So there's a natural like ebb and flow and there's something about us in our society that doesn't value the feminine, that doesn't value slowing down, that, that doesn't let us ebb. And if we ebb, we feel guilty. We feel like we're not being productive. We feel like we should be more motivated. But the ocean ebbs and it doesn't feel guilty or bad or like it should be more productive. <laughs> and actually from the ebb, the momentum happens that allows it to flow with such less effort. And I think that's where we're at as a culture, as women, like really taking a stand for embracing the ebb and the flow and the natural way the universe actually works versus this man-made banana 
matrix crazy pants busy world <laughs> that we've all been just trying to to stay afloat in until this year. And then it's kind of like, oh wait, we actually can't stay afloat. Now we really have to deal with what's underneath the surface. Yes. And many people feel guilty about doing okay during COVID that we're going through right now. It's it's fascinating. It's like I'm really sad, but I should be really um, grateful because I'm not sick and my friends are doing worse than me. And I'm like, it's okay to feel what you're feeling. Just stop focusing on everybody else. And what are you feeling? What's going on for you? And we were so bad at that. You know, I, I, as a dating coach and a relationship coach, I see this feminine masculine thing going on all the time. I mean, I think one of the key reasons that so many women are single is because they're only in their masculine and they don't know how to lead with the feminine. They don't know how to bring that quality that actually men are craving. Uh, most men are craving and some men are leading with their feminine as well, but it's, it's, you have to have that balance in place. And they're like, you know, here's all my achievements. This is what I've done. I have a whole list of things and this is what I bring to the table. And what, blah, blah, blah. it's just like, mm -mm, not working for you. No, we, we have been um, really imprinted. I think that words are a really important word. It's different than beliefs. We hear a lot about like beliefs, like you have to change your beliefs, change your thoughts, and then you'll be better, which there, that is, there's a point to that, but we're talking about imprinting here. Mm -hmm. And so imprinting is mental, it's emotional, it's cellular, like it's deeply in us. And and, and, and if you can't see the imprint that causes you to do like you're, you're saying in relationship, like I was saying in my relationship with Noah, who is very, what they would call a very balanced man. Like he's, you know, he's <laughs> six foot tall, 250 pounds. It's like, but he's a gentle giant, you know, he's a gentle giant. And I, um, and I am, I am like, the, you know, I'm like the, 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 the woman on the, on the, on the, on the, you know, the, doo -doo -doo -doo, you know, that's how I go into the world. And so, you know, I will, I will, I will pull more towards the masculine. He will pull more towards the feminine. And, and that's the reason why we make a good partnership because I've taught him more about being in his fiery passion and his, you know, his, I don't, I don't use the word ambition, but more like his, like living in alignment with his soul path and like, you know, going for it. And he is oftentimes the one when I can't give myself permission to chill out, mm -hmm. to relax, to slow down. I mean, he, he's, he has taught me so much about nurturing myself because he's so nurturing to me. And so this, pro I mean, this is like, I mean, I can tell over 10 years of like really looking at my own imprints and like, what, what is it that keeps me driving so much? What keeps me from it? They're never feeling like there's enough that no matter how much I do, there's not enough. Or even in my partnership with Noah, you know, given that you focus so much on relationships, Sandy, you know, one of my big come to, come to, come to Jesus for lack of a term, but you know, come to like aha moment around value was I, it was, it was, gosh, back in 2009 and Noah, it was, no, it was 2008, right? As the big crash happened in 2008 and Noah had left his corporate job. I had already been out. We emancipated him and he was, he just couldn't like, he couldn't manifest his career into form. You know, I'm like, I'm a manifester. I make stuff happen. You know, he just couldn't do it. And he would, he tried to be my assistant, which was awful. One should, a husband or a wife should never be the assistant to their partner. And I was just so mad at him. I was just so mad. And, and we have a very loving relationship. We're best friends, but like for three weeks, we did not like each other. We did not like each other much at all. And we were in our polls. I was on my side judging him of like, what's wrong with you that you can't manifest in the world and make these things happen. And he was on the other side feeling beat up by me, which of course I was, you know, honestly, you know, I was, and because I didn't know this yet about value. So I'll tie this around to value. And, you know, the thing about Noah is, is he is very loving and he's very kind. He meets me with kindness always. I do not always do that. That is not the way my personality is set up. I'm also a Scorpio. So I got a little tail in there. Um, and I remember sitting on the couch and this was, this was early in my, um, in my journey into the feminine and understanding it and living it and embodying it. And he's on one side of the living room and I'm on the other. And I have this epiphany where I'm like, oh my God, I value my ability to achieve 
create money, um, you know, make an impact, be successful in the terms of how we look at success more than I value Noah's ability to nurture mm -hmm. and be loving. And like that nurturing, I, I, I've, and I'm like, wow, what does that say about my value system? Um, and the value system that were, that were, that were, that were, um, imprinted into, and it isn't to be nurturing. It's like, I needed both to be nurturing, to be a nurturing, loving being, and to be someone who can achieve and initiate and bring things into action. So it was like a big aha for me. And I was like, wow, why do we as a culture value that more? And how have I internalized that within myself? Hmm. Wow. That's a great story. So so that was like a big aha moment for you where you realized we need both. Like, so it's this message that kept coming to you. We need both. We need both. And you had been so focused on the achievement side. And, um, but that's, that's beautiful that your husband brings that quality, but that you were able to see it. I think so many of us have conflict in relationships because we can't appreciate the qualities that our partner brings it seems like a weakness. It seems like a deficit. There's other things missing and we're just looking at what's wrong instead of what's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or we, we can't give ourselves what our partners give us. And it's really a lack within ourselves, right? So here I had this beautiful person in my life who's so nurturing, but part of my work in the world is, um, is, is actually being able to do that for myself. So like, for example, every, every year on self-love day, which is February 13th, one of the things I have people do is we take a promise you take a self-love promise that you keep for the whole year. And two years ago, my promise was I promised to design a life I love because I found myself that I had, you know, kind of yet again, created a, a reality in my business and my life in which I was, I don't really suffer um, from physical burnout anymore. So there's nine different kinds of burnout. Physical is the last place that shows up for people, but I, I do still get trapped in passion burnout and passion burnout is where you're giving to what you love so much. And you're actually not getting what you need, um, to nurture yourself. And so I made this promise. I promised to design a life that I love. And I was like, huh, what does that even mean? <laughs> you know, but it was like this, this, a uh, part of this aha of like, um, of like, wow, like I don't, I don't know that I have set my life up for me to feel nurtured unless I'm receiving it from Noah or unless I've hit passion burnout and now I'm pissed, you know, and I'm like, oh, I deserve this. Like I need to be nurtured now. And I'm like, this is no way. Like I can't, I have to cultivate that inside of myself. So when we talk about women of value and understanding value, we have to value that, you know, and then get really honest with ourselves about how we don't value it and then bring the and then bring the value both the masculine and the feminine together and that's you know that that's i think that's the journey that we're many of us are on right now and we do it in relationship we also do it through our careers and you know for some of us it takes getting sick physically for that to actually happen and so i'm what i'd like to do is get us to the point where we don't have to have distress and disease and divorce and drama but if we can be conscious about these things within us, then we can actually work with them. Yes, yeah, so true. I have seen people get sick and promise that that's, that's the message that they needed. And then they go right back. I, I was working with a woman many years ago. She ended up with emergency gallbladder surgery. She was very overweight in a terrible marriage. Just everything, her job, just everything was stress. And she also, she was an overdoer and overgiver, stuff you talk about in your book. And she was like, yes, the universe is telling me, slow down, slow down. I need to really be more conscious of my life. And then boom, right back. Because it is hard to, to really sustain change. So what are some of the things that you work with people on to be able to sustain that change once they get back to real life again? <laughs> You know, it's so interesting because oftentimes, like you're saying, we have these big wake up calls for us to pay attention, which is by the way, what's happening in the universe right now. <laughs> it's like the universe is like, you humans wake up. Like we're like big, like let's, let's not get any more of these. <laughs> like let's, let's yeah. um, come back to what I like to call simple, but significant. 
And it really is, I'm a big believer. I'm a big believer in expanding our perspective and opening up our awareness and elevating our wisdom. But I'm also a big believer in let's make it practical. And how do we actually do this like in our, in our daily lives? And so one of the things that is, is really true, I believe, is that um, we need to be connected to our deeper wisdom to our deeper, what is called our intuition, right? And that is, and when you think about, it's also, when I teach feminine and masculine power, I, I teach this, um, actually I'll show it to you that I all listen, you can kind of see it. Can you see that? It looks like a figure eight. You also, you can't see, it's called a harmonizer. Uh -huh. And it looks like a figure eight on its side. So I got like, a, like an infinity sign. Yeah. Uh -huh. the feminine power goes on the left and the masculine power goes on the right. And what you want to do is when those two harmonize with each other, you gain access to, to, to an elevated level of perspective and an elevated level of understanding. So on the left, in this particular one power spectrum, there are intuition, the feminine is on the left, and on the right is our intellect. And together, when you those work together, you can access wisdom. Well, most of us are not taught how our intuition works. I mean, I just did a, a talk for 20 high school girls that were very highly educated and very well to do financially. And when I asked how many of them had learned about how their intuition works, I got half a hand, half a hand out of 20 girls, young women. <sighs> That's a, that's a talk for another time. <laughs> is um, but for all of us, like we have to be connected to that, and that intuition doesn't come from your mind. It doesn't come from your head. It comes from your heart, and it comes from your body, and it comes from that deeper knowing that's connected to something that is bigger than than us, whatever that is for you. And so you want to cultivate that daily. You want to be connected to yourself, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and and energetically every day. You want to be tuned in to kind of the bigger picture and your own intuition every day. It's always there, that presence, but you actually have to invite it in. So most of us, you know, we, we go through our lives thinking we have to do it all. We have to put it all on our shoulders. It's all up to me. It's freaking exhausting. And we don't open up our hearts to being connected to something bigger, whether it's the earth or it's the cosmos or it's each other. And that's part of why we're all starving, you know, like for this connection right now. And so what I'd say to everybody is what do you, what, what is your daily morning practice and what is your daily evening practice? These are called bookends. How do you start the first hour of your day and how do you end the last hour of your day? And are you connecting, I call it the four points of connection to your divine downline, whatever that is for you, right? So that you're not, you're like, you're, you're in the beam, as I like to say, you're connecting to the earth and your physical body. You're connecting to yourself, your own emotional self-love and what you need. And you're also connecting to others that in a meaningful way that makes you feel loved and held and supported. Those four things, I don't start my day. I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't talk to the outside world. I don't go, I don't, I don't go on the computer, like until I've created the, those levels of connection, because if you do, you're like a windsock with no pole. You're just going to be reacting to everything around you and picking up all the anxiety out there that then basically stirs up your own anxiety and upset. And it seems so simple. And then people are like, well, what? I don't have an hour to just sit on a cushion. I'm like, no one said sit on a cushion for an hour. I said, be mindful about how you create the ritual of your morning. And then the last hour of your day, because the last hour of your day, what you put into your emotional, energetic, mental field goes to bed with you. And it affects your sleep and everything. So it's very, these very simple things, right? I mean, I know you know this too, Sandy. It's like, this is, and it's like, people are like, oh, I just <laughs> need like something more like sensational or, you know, and like, we're like addicted to sensation. I'm like, no, really, it's just very practical. And if yeah. you do these things, you'll feel better. You'll feel more in harmony. You'll make better choices. You'll be more tuned in. And people want the sexy seven-step panacea. Just give me a pill and make it better fix. And that just it just doesn't work long-term. Yeah, I totally. I mean, uh, so many people I speak to, the first thing in the morning is news, uh, email, you know, and what they don't realize is that answering emails is actually doing for others before you do for yourself. You're already serving other people. You haven't had time to nurture yourself. And also just being on your phone late at night, people sleep with their damn phones. It's like, put the phone away, have a phone, you know, boundary for yourself. Just that alone is, is huge. huge. And, you know, I personally, I... I take a bath every night. I read every night. I have a whole 
ritual around that. I, I, I wake up to delicious coffee. <laughs> like that's really important to me. I'm not a big meditator. I know lots of people meditate, but that doesn't really work for me. But I, the quiet for me is really important. And I think, you know, just to find what works for you, but don't immediately go to stress. You know, I think that dance, a lot of people dance in the morning. Um, you know, I think just simple. Yeah, there's lots of different ways. This is why I, I you know, I, I do meditate. I've been meditating for 20 years. I've been doing yoga for 20 years, but people get, they think that's the only way to do it. Meditating is just about connecting. It's about clearing your mind and connecting to something that is that is you and beyond you. And, and so I've studied, I've studied the yogic science as part of my yogic, as part of my tradition. And in yogic science, they, they say that all the stuff that we do, the walking, the yoga, the whatever, it's just to touch what they call, it's called the shunya in yoga, which is the, just that point of stillness within the self. And if you can just touch that in, in Christian mystic science, they call it, um, they call it the click, you know, you just feel that click. And so all the different traditions, wisdom traditions talk about it. And you just want to feel that click. It's a connection point. And it's like that instance, you know how this shows up for you, Sandy, but for me, it's like, if I feel connected to like, and what partly why I love living here to, to the earth. And I can feel that connection to spirit, what that is for me. And I feel connected to love from another human or my border collie who loves to give me lots of kisses in the morning. We have love store in the morning and it's just a big old love fest. And then, and then myself, I mean, every morning I check in with my life force. It's one of the, it's, I've been doing it since 2012. I say, what is my life force today? Get a reading on a scale of zero to 100. And then I ask, what do I need to receive today? And that question of what I need to receive today then basically informs my whole day. So like today it was Christine, you need to receive a slower pace. Um, and I've been, it's been a big year for all of us. I've also, you know, finished a book and unveiled a book and you know, lots of things we don't need to talk about, um, but just say it's been, in, it's been an intense, I don't use the word busy. It's been an intense output year. And so I'm in my downshift to be able to be able to say, I'm not going to keep operating at that level of intensity. I need to downshift. And so today, which happens to be a Tuesday, was like, I need a slow start, I need a slow start day. And that's one of the ways I, I, I sometimes start my day, a slow start day. And then I just need to go through my day slower. And notice I'm just slowing down. I do. <laughs> and, and, and then I have to trust it. And I think that's one of the reasons <clears throat> why we don't put these things into practice because we're afraid what will happen if we slow down. Definitely. Um, and it, it's, it's, you know, that achievement thing, because I, I published a book this year as well. And it's mm. like, I finished and I, I barely celebrated it. I was in such a mode of get it done, get it done, get it done. And my son was the one who said to me, mom, this is an amazing moment. Let's just celebrate. He's great at centering me also. Like just that, that. Good men. It's good to have good men. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's good to have good men in your life. It is, it is. And um, we do that. You know, we, we've been bred to be really strong achievers and really selfless caregivers. And we don't really know how to receive. We kind of suck at it. <laughs> well, well I, I, I'm getting better every day. In fact, my self-love promise this year was I promise to savor the process and I promise to savor what I create. I promise to savor what I create. And it's so right. It's so interesting. It's like to go on to the next thing. Like we're so programmed to go on to the next thing and you know how long it takes to birth a book? I mean, like you first you're living it, right? And then you start writing it. And um, and and we do that. I mean, if everyone listening, you, we all do that. Mm -hmm. But there's gonna be no like space fairy who's gonna come down from you know the tree, like Glenda the Good, which say, Oh, here you can have some space. Here, savor your life. Here we're gonna like this is the piece about about valuing women and being empowered. We are the ones to say the way that we're working and living, this is banana pants. This it's, it's all human made. I mean, it's all made up. The stock market is made up. The way we educate our children is made up. Every system on the planet, other than the ones that are made by mother nature, all made up, all made up by humans, which means we can change them. 
but it, but, it, but part of the reason they haven't changed is because we, even in ourselves as women, this is the hard thing to swallow and like really embrace. We don't value the things we actually say we want space, right? People say time, but what they really want is space, right? To savor. And so we don't, we don't value it through our actions, not because it's our fault. It's none of our fault. We've just been so imprinted. And there's a lot of fear inside of us that we don't even know is there and a lot of programming. So I feel like by doing our own personal part, you know, Sandy, you're amazing son saying, you know, mom, it's okay to slow down and savor it. I got the Noah over there. And for those of you that don't have one of those, you know, <laughs> friends are great. You can, this is what we call a permission line. Like it's okay. Cause we're, we're breaking through these old ways of working and, and then we can see, well, gosh, well, how could we create an economic system that valued sustainability? How, how would we set up our education system and our work systems what is it? Why is it five days a week? Where is this ridiculous 40 hour day thing that no one really does anyway, you know, and to design a whole different way of thinking and being in the world. But first we have to get this value right in our own hearts. All social and systemic change has to have personal transformation at the root. Um, and that's the harder part because you can't take a pill to, to do that. Sometimes you need a pill to just get through the rocky stuff, but eventually you got to go in there, you know, and you got to, you got to go in there. You got to go into the heart and people are scared of that. Yeah. So true. I, I uh, so much that you said, I want to speak about, but we don't have 10 hours, but I, I, I want to focus on the receiving part because that is so key, you know, and, and something that really helped me is just thinking about a woman's anatomy that we're built to receive. Like, you know, if you think about who we are as women, we're built to receive, but we struggle with receiving and even receiving and asking. And I, I, I remember the day that somebody said, when you don't receive what somebody gives you, you're actually taking away a gift that somebody's trying to give you. And we don't look at it that way. We just look at it, well, I can do it. I can take care of it all and I've got it all. But then there's resentment. And I mean, oh my God, I, I just, one of the first things I do with clients is, is slow them down and look at all the things on their plate and ask them what they can get rid of, what they can delegate, what they can never do again um, and getting other people involved. You know, we have families who, how many people train their kids to help out in the house? How many people ask for help from a friend, ask for, receive something from somebody. So I think that's, I just wanted to really highlight that because receiving is key and it, it's not only a gift to yourself, it's a gift to the people who give to you. It's paramount actually um, for us to, um, and it's one of those things that kind of like with self-love when, I got the message, like you need self-love or when I heard the message, you need the feminine. They're so like amorphous. It's like, what does that even mean? Um, you know, when I, when I teach, I teach feminine superpowers. So I've teach these 13 different feminine superpowers. The first one is receiving. And I remember when I started teaching, I'm like, how do I teach receiving? <laughs> Cause again, it's like this whole, like, it's so big and amorphous. And when I was working on overwhelmed and over it last summer, I sat down and I said, okay, what would I feel like? if I really was strong at receiving, if I felt received in the world, because it's that way too, if I felt received in the world and I felt like I was receiving what I needed, what would I feel like? And from that um, came these 15 I am receiving mantras. And I'd love just to share like five of them Please. with everybody to see maybe you can pick one that, that you all that, that feels good for you that you might want to work with. Um, so one is I am nurtured. I am met, I am supported, I am nourished, I am valued, I am seen, I am guided, I am just doing my part. <laughs> And there's more, but those are like a good couple. And just one of my practices is I choose one I am every year. And I focus on that I am, um, and I, to really incorporate it into my life. And this year mine was, I am met because I really wanted to feel met as I put the book into the world, as I step forward in the world, but I had to cultivate that first in myself. And so one way I did that is every morning, this is a little bit simple practice. You start 
you start imprinting the I am into your brain and your body first thing in the morning. So first, when you first wake up in the morning, before you do anything else, you register, oh, I'm awake. And then you say that I am to yourself. So for me, it would be like, I am met, or right now I'm also working with, I am nurtured. And you say that to yourself, just to like feel it, you know, and even just consider it. And it starts to program your brain for that first thing versus the phone. Because part of the reason people reach for the phone is they don't have rituals to do instead. So we need those other rituals to do instead. And then in the moments when you feel scared or wobbly, you go back to that mantra, I am. And it starts to soothe your heart. It starts to calm you down. And then you can ask, okay, if I was this, what would my choice be, right? What would my choice be? So as I'm working with, um, I am met and putting over one and over into the world, I could certainly focus on the ways in which that's not true, right? And that this hasn't happened or this hasn't happened or whatever. But if I choose to look through the lens of I am met, I mean, just being here with you, Sandy, is a, is a way like I am met by other, it's part of my fear that I can have is I'm going to put this into the world and no one's going to understand it because it's been kind of <laughs> always seemed to be ahead of what everyone else is talking about, except for, you know, beloveds that are, are, are on that same wavelength. And then I don't feel received because they're like, they're, they want the pill. They want the seven steps to lose 20 pounds. They don't actually want to go deeper into the heart. <laughs> and it's, and I'm like, but it's been so lovely. I've been cultivating this all year. All the podcasts I've been on have been saying, wow, this is the best, such great timing, such great timing. And I've felt met and I'm just like soaking it up, you know, and, and savoring it. But I also had to meet myself this year. I had to really be with me and, and, and both then kind of happened together. And this again, seems so subtle, maybe a little esoteric, but it's very practical. And, and then it works because we're looking for that thing out there that we have to feel first inside of here, right. which I'm sure you work with all the time in relation. I mean, it's, it's paramount to creating strong relationships. It's so paramount. And, and I, I, you keep using the word feel and we don't know how to feel. We don't stop and feel. And I think that felt sense has to come from your own meeting yourself first. And when you can feel it, you can recognize it in others and you can recognize it when it happens on the outside. So I think just wanna point that out because we're so, when we're busy with the busy, <laughs> with the doing and the busy and the achievement and the numbing ourselves and all the other stuff we do, we're not feeling anymore. And a lot of the work I do has to do with communication, feelings, needs, what's going on for us. How do we know first we have to be present with ourselves? Because if we don't even know what am I feeling, just pissed off is not enough. Like we, we really need to know how to get under that. And mm -hmm. then we can articulate and we can be more compassionate, just like you were with Noah. You could recognize what he was offering you and his incredible kindness and his gifts in the world. We can't do that if we're constantly running on empty and we have a big hole that we never fill. Yes. <laughs> underline, <laughs> underline, underline, underline. And, and what, you're, what you're talking about, Sandy, and everyone, what we're talking about is we're getting to the roots. This is the reason why we don't, we haven't, don't have societal change and we don't get the personal change we want is because we're, we're on the surface and we're, and we're looking at the symptoms. We're putting band-aids on everything because to go into the, to, to get to the root of it is to actually go in there and you got to go in there and you, and you got to go in there with a guide. So not go in there by yourself. You know, it's like, I've had amazing, amazing teachers and mentors. And when the 30, when my life blew up at 8,000 popsicle sticks, I had a therapist, a body worker and a, um, <laughs> and a spiritual mentor. And, um, and I've been through many different trainings and, and to get me here, to get to this place where we're, and I still, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was feeling wobbly. I was working on something deeper in my own heart that I'm, you know, in the process, I always look at myself in December and be like, hey, what do I not want to take into the year, the next year that's coming from the wound versus my wholeness. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, you know, I, I got the thing with the, my male partner, good. No, and I are like, good, good, good. My struggle comes in my female relationships. And so it's the area that I know. And so I'm like, okay, here we go. Good to go in there again. I'm like, oh, look, there's some wounds. Oh, look, <laughs> there's some more wound stuff. And then I like, I went and I, you know, I sat with my, with my teacher and she held space for me and created space for me. And I, and then I know enough because I've been doing this for so long, how to go through my own processes. But, but I, I was, I didn't start there. You know, I, 
like I said, you all grew up in Chicago in the middle of, you know, I didn't know what energy was other than the thing you plug, you know, your computer into. <laughs> and so I just want to say to everybody, this is one of the big shifts that I write about in overwhelmed and over it, this belief that we have to take it all on or do it all ourselves. Mm-mm. We need to, it's okay. We actually need support. And we, for women need sisterhood for men. We need brotherhood for all of us. We need Sangha. We need community um, around us. And that's how it's supposed to happen. And I think that, um, I think you actually spend less money and you'll go a lot faster in my, my, um, my, 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 uh, experience, not that you don't need to invest time and money and energy in it, but it, um, the payoff it's with you forever. You know, you really do. It's like, I'm so much more of who I am and I know who I am. And I, you know, I always say self-love, self-acceptance is the deepest part of self-love. I'm not a hundred percent still have a little comparison queen who shows up sometimes. <laughs> um, but I'm aware of how she operates and I'm aware when that's operating me so that I can get into my heart and actually ask questions like what's going on in there. So that's a question I'll give to everybody. Just you know, we're going to go into the lightning round here, but just like when you when you feel off, when you feel afraid, when you feel whatever that emotion is, slow down and go into your heart and your body and get curious what's going on in there. And then what do I need? You know, this, what do I need? What am I? What am I feeling? What's going on in there? And then what do I need? And that will open up the portal to the next step. Yeah, I love that. It's it's uh, back to the intuition, back to your inner wisdom. I, I was on the call with this with a client this morning who was she has to prepare something for her son's becoming an Eagle Scout. And all the other moms were making these elaborate presentations that they were gonna put out on tables. She goes, I don't want to do that. I don't want to make like a trifold and a and I said, Well, what do you want to do? She goes, I'm gonna take a box of his stuff and I'm gonna put it on the table on a tablecloth. I said, That's fantastic. Like, what would it look like if you stopped comparing yourself to what you should be and who are you? And we, you know, growing up with that compare and despair and all the other crap, it's just like enough already. Um, all right, lightning round, we're going there. <laughs> um, first question, I used to think I wasn't blank enough. Doing mm, enough. All, all that doing and you weren't doing enough. <laughs> wow, you never could do enough. What was the number one thing holding you back from becoming a woman of value? Being willing to go deeper into my heart beyond all the walls of protection that I had built up mm. for many years. Yeah, all those walls. <laughs> and that's great. Um, what is the best advice you can give to a woman who wants to become more empowered? Know your heart, because that is, the, that is your power center know your heart, know, know how it works, know your wounds, know the wholeness, know both, know how it operates. And from there, anything is possible, but I don't even know how to be an empowered woman if you're not in your heart and also in your body. Yeah. It's the combination of both. What advice would you give to your younger self? Stay awake. <laughs> Stay awake. I, 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 I was, I woke up around him. I was awake at 18 and, um, I went back to sleep and I woke up again at 26 and then I got scared. And, um, because of those, that wound, you know, I had a, I had a wound I didn't know was in there and I just, you know, it's, it was fine. I got good stories out of it. I got a good first book out of it. I could send love grams to my ex person, but the, but the truth is I knew he wasn't the guy for me six months into dating. I just kept going for 14 years and six months after that fact. So I, um, I think stay awake. Yeah. Stay awake is good. And not just from sleeping. It's the other kind of awake. <laughs> what is something that people often get wrong about you? I think in the, in the past people have believed that I didn't need support. Mm. You know, that I kind of had it all together. This is by design. This is how my personality is. You know, she's got it. She's just got it. And, and I do have it in some ways. And, but I, but I really, um, but I really do need support and it's, it's, it was safer for me to just do things on my own or pay people money to do things versus actually receiving genuine generosity, uh, without strings. Yeah. 
And finally, Christine, how would you like to be remembered? Um, for someone who deeply cared, as someone who deeply cared. Mm. Beautiful. Well, I can see that you deeply care. <laughs> You've already got that going on. And I think that, you know, the, the message of you can't do it all alone, that you're not supposed to do it all alone. We all need guides and we all have them on some level, but I think, I, I think a lot of us think it's a weakness to ask for help and it's not, it's actually a strength. And this conversation is so inspirational. And I know that so many people will listen and be inspired and I hope they don't just listen, but they actually take action and make some changes. So thank you. And please tell our audience how they can find you, buy your books, all the good stuff. Yeah, I'd love to stay connected with everybody. One of the best ways to stay connected is to um, check out my, my, my podcast, Feminine Power Time, um, which, is a, which is a podcast I do. And that's a good way to stay connected to me, do that weekly. So that's good. And then um, go to Overwhelmed and Over It. That's the book's website. And that has, um, it has all kinds of good stuff, tells you where to get it and all of that. And that's also on my, it'll connect you to my website too. So it's on my Christina Rilo. A R Y Y L O dot com site, but overwhelmed and over it is easier <laughs> to uh, to remember. And then feminine power time. So it'd be great to stay connected with all of you. Well, thank you, thank you so much for doing this beautiful work in the world and helping us all be more balanced human beings. I really mm. appreciate you. Mm. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you everyone for having me here. Many blessings. If you would like to step more fully into your value, grab a free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Becoming a Woman of Value on my website, thewomanofvalue.com. Just click the link at the top of the homepage. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the subscribe button in your listening app. And if there's something in this episode that inspired you, please share it with others. Because the more we share these inspirational stories, the more women of value we will have in this world. I'll see you next time.